Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, are you being tricked into giving up your privacy? We examine the erosion of privacy in the digital age. Today we're joined by a real web celebrity. He's been called a techno-utopian, but prefers the term techno-optimist. He is an activist, a blogger, and co-editor of Boing Boing, the popular group blog with more than three million visitors a month. The publication's been called an outspoken critic of censorship. He also wrote the best-selling book, Little Brother. His latest work, Homeland, was released earlier this month. Corey Doctorow, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much. Nice yeah. to be here. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Now, to Corey's left, as always, is our producer digital producer, Malika Bilal, and she's bringing in your live social media interaction with us during the whole program. Malika, we've got a lot to talk about with Corey and with members of our uh, Google Plus Hangout today. Exactly. We've got four great members of our Hangout. Now, for those of you at home, you can always join uh, a Hangout in the future. Make sure you add us to your circles on Google Plus by going to the link below. Hi, I'm John Geed. I'm based in Kashmir. I'm a journalist and I'm in the stream. So how much is your personal information worth? Today we're living in a world where everything's been digitized. All of our personal records, governmental and non-governmental, have moved online. And it hasn't stopped there. The age of social networking means people everywhere are sharing personal habits, preferences, interests, opinions, and a lot more with every click. Here's some information about how much data is shared on Facebook. Thirty billion pieces of content a month. Unbelievable. So, the result of all this information sharing, a massive appetite for data gathering. In fact, since 2005, the number of data broker companies has more than doubled. These companies gather information on individuals and then they package it as a profile that gets sold to another party, be it a person or a company. So you might ask, how do they get that information? Well, a lot of it comes from your own computers. Every website you visit, every Google search, every like on Facebook. So. Should we be concerned? Are we undervaluing our own privacy? Well, that's where we're going to begin with Corey Doctorow. So Corey, how serious is this problem? Well, I think that the problem is not that any individual disclosure will lead to something bad, but that over the lifetime of all the disclosures that you make, the chances that they will be pieced together in a way that you find harmful goes up. And the problem is that as we aggregate all this data together, it's really hard to disaggregate it, right? When we open up files, essentially, surveillance files on tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, and we uh, privately gather them, and then we flog them off, and then they're privately re-aggregated, and so on, the likelihood that these things will ever go away goes down to zero, and the likelihood that they'll leak starts to approach 100%. And some people are sitting out there thinking, whoa, this guy is right off the bat sounds like a conspiracy theorist. But is our, is our privacy really eroding to that degree? Well, it's not so much a conspiracy as, as just a lack of uh, any kind of care on the part of, of industry. It's not like there's any incentive on their part to actually stop you from disclosing too much. Um, and it's not like any one of those harmful disclosures that comes to you, that the bad results of you disclosing, like losing a job because you said the wrong thing and it's come back to haunt you or, or some other way that you get into trouble. Uh, it's not like any one of those is, is particularly a disincentive to them either. And since they have an incentive to gather data and since they can hold it cheaply, I think that ultimately you'll see just titanic amounts of data being gathered. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, let's talk about like, specific examples of how this uh, is relatable to our lives. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we've got a great Google Plus Hangout today, so I want to start by introducing them. Jane Litt, a lawyer and founder of DearAuthor.com. Daniel Wright, a writer for FireDogLake.com. Jonathan Colton, a musician. And Chris Ruin, author of Freeloading, How Our Insatiable Appetite for Free Content Starves Creativity. Thank you all for being here. Now, I want to start with you, Jane. Uh, you write extensively on ebook publishing and, and the software that locks an ebook to an app 
or to a device. Um, tell us what this means. Can you tell us about digital protection rights, what that means, how it is applicable to our lives, uh, and what it means for authors? Well. Jane, you might have to unmute your microphone. DRM stands for Digital Rights Management, and it uh, is a piece of software that is embedded in the books that you buy digitally, and it controls the where you can read the book, on what device you can read the book, whether you can share, resell, print, uh, or lend that book. And it's a way for the content creators or the distributors like publishers to control how that book is being disseminated into the public. It's also a way for um, platform providers like Amazon or Kobo or Apple to learn a little more, unfortunately, about your reading habits. They can tell when you opened a book, when you closed the book, where in the book you stopped, what highlights you made, what was important to you in that book. Um, they can tell when you're buying more books, what what type of purchaser is buying at night versus in the morning, how often you're reading over your lunch hour, and that sort of thing. So digital rights management is a way for uh, content creators to control your ebooks and also kind of look into your reading habits. All right, well, I want to talk a little bit more about all the gathering of that information. You know, as the Internet continues to grow, there are a lot more opportunities for netizens to share content. Take a look at this clip showing just how much consumers actually rely on the web. So 4 billion searches per day, 175 million per hour, 2.9 million per minute. That's a lot of data available. Corey Jane's talking about gathering all of this information. How is all of this information that's gathered being used? Well, I think the, 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 the structural problem with the way that this information is gathered is that um, our devices leak it without us knowing it. We, we don't make any affirmative step, and, and information just sort of streams out of our devices, out of our network connections, and so on. And, and she talked about how DRM is a way for um, uh, content creators uh, to control the use of their works. It's, it's better to say that it's a way for DRM companies to um, hijack the relationship between creators and audiences because we have a funny law in America and in most of the world that says that it's illegal to remove DRM even if you're not breaking the law otherwise. So what that means is if I sell you a book that's locked to your Kindle, and I want you to unlock it to, to put it on your Kobo, even though I wrote the book, I can't authorize it, only Amazon can. And so what this means is that um, it allows these, these intermediaries, these mere retailers, to lock uh, our customers as creators into their platform. And more insidiously, because removing the lock is illegal, and since you have to remove the lock to find out if the device is doing anything bad, like streaming data that you prefer not to, to, to stream, it actually makes puts us all at risk because security researchers can't delve into the internals of the device and tell you, for example, about the that, that it's that it's streaming information. So, are you, you actually want. saying that our computers have a way of overriding what our own desires might be in terms of our privacy? Well, that's what digital rights management is. It's a way to get computers to say, "I can't let you do that, Dave," because uh, digital rights management. There's no one who wants a device with digital rights management on it. There's no customer for a book who woke up this morning and said, "You know what I want? I want to buy a book that I can't lend." Or I want to buy a book I can't sell used. Or I want to buy a book that I can only use on one device and not on another. So in order, for, in order for the device to stop you from doing that, it has to have some hidden feature that when you ask it to do something that it doesn't want to do, that feature can be invoked and, and tell you not to do it anymore. It essentially has to come with spyware out of the box. There's not really a model for a computer that can run every program except for the one that the publisher would prefer you not to run. Our closest equivalent is a computer with spyware on it that uh, is invoked when you try to do the thing the publisher wants you to, so I, to I do. So I get it for books, but what about the idea of companies just wanting to be more efficient and make it easier for you to shop and understand what your preferences are and streamline things? Why is that a bad thing? Well, I, I don't know that it is a bad thing, but I think that if we're trading our, our, our privacy in exchange for some modicum of convenience, 
uh, and there's an economy and we're, we're, we're giving something and getting something back, that it should be up to us to choose how much we're trading. And it's not really. Um, right now, uh, as soon as you land on a page, you might stream 100 pieces of data to 100 different data brokers. And the, the rubric is, oh, well, by, by entering these digital premises, you've already agreed to give away all this information in exchange for the service that's being provided. But, you know, it's a funny kind of contract to form. It's a funny kind of agreement. It's like saying we have a marketplace where every time you walk into a store, the merchant decides how much of your stuff she can take away from you and then gives you back something that you, didn't, you couldn't predict on your way in through the door. Well, it's interesting you mentioned we're trading our privacy, and often it happens in, in the form of clicking something that says we agree to this without actually reading that mm -hmm. we agree to it. People online are saying, well, the onus is on the user. Fahad says, this is the 21st century, people. Have to learn to get with it. We have to adapt and be cautious. Uh, another tweet from Khalid who says, users should be vigilant, of course, but viral providers are becoming surreptitious with attaining data. So lines are blurred. He go, goes on to say, particularly since individuals piece their own privacy by willingly volunteering personal information. Chris, in our hangout, I want your thoughts on this. Is the onus on the user? Well, to some degree, um, you know, the, the onus is on the user, but it's, I, you know, I'm not sure what the user is really supposed to do about it. I, I, it seems to me if you truly want to protect your privacy, um, you shouldn't use the internet at all. Um, you know, the, the economy of the internet is based upon free content and you know, if you expect these websites and, you know, services like Facebook to be making money and it's sort of off the table that people are going to be paying, you know, either through micropayments or some other form of paid content, um, I don't know what we should really expect, you know. Um, so I have, I have issues with the concerns that Corey is raising. Absolutely. I'm not, um, you know, in favor of anybody invading my privacy, but there seems to be a um, almost a structural issue um, with the internet and the economy that it's running on, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what to do about that or what you do about it. Corey, you've got a particular problem with Facebook, and you've said that it trains us to undervalue our privacy. How so? Yeah, I think Facebook is is something like a Skinner box that's designed to teach us to undervalue our privacy. I mean, valuing your privacy in the first place is hard enough because uh, the consequences of the wrong private privacy disclosure are separated by so much time and space from the disclosure itself. That getting good at privacy is like getting good at soccer by taking a run at the ball and kicking and then going home and a month later they tell you whether or not your foot hit the ball, right? <laughs> you make a disclosure now and six months later, a year later, it bites you in the butt. How are you possibly going to learn from that? So we but, don't know the consequences now of what we're doing. Sure, but, but Facebook stacks the deck because when you show up at Facebook and you make a disclosure, you know, um, uh, here I am, does my butt look big in these jeans, I'm going to have a baby, I had too much to drink last night. The algorithm by which that is exposed to your friends is, is secret and it's gamed by Facebook in order to evoke kind of an erratic response. Sometimes you get a lot of response and sometimes you get very little response. And what that does, either by design or by accident, is it creates a form of intermittent reinforcement. And, and as any behaviorist will tell you, if you give someone intermittent reinforcement, if sometimes when you do something you get a reward, you'll try everything to try and find the pattern of what it is that invokes the reward. So if you make it random enough, you know, you can get a pigeon to press the lever all day long to get food pellets if the food pellets come out at random. It's only if the food pellets come out in a reliable way that a pigeon will only take enough to, to sate its appetite. Well, let's uh, segue this into copyright, because that's what mm -hmm. our community members uh, seem to be wanting to talk about. Mohammed Hamish says, copyright is the biggest threat to creativity online. That's in response to a question we asked him. He said, just as Picasso's work are his own creative work, the online ones are entitled to those who produce them. Now, for this, I want to go to Jonathan in our hangout, because, Jonathan, you have an interesting story that actually Corey recently wrote a piece on for The Guardian um, on what happened to a song of yours. Can you tell us about what happened? Yeah, sure. Uh, I uh, Back in 2005, I did a cover of a Sir Mix-a-Lot song called Baby Got Back uh, that was sort of a, a, a sweet, uh, folky arrangement of, the, of that rap song. And um, uh, I discovered recently that uh, the show Glee on Fox uh, created a note-for-note -note copy of that uh, arrangement of that song and, uh, and included it in one of their episodes. And... Uh, I was never contacted or informed that that was going to happen, and uh, uh, or offered any money or even given any credit for it. Uh, and it was a very strange thing to have happened. I've since learned a little bit more about the copyright situation, and it's one of those situations where uh, the copyright law doesn't quite match up with 
uh, common sense and people's feelings about what is right and what is wrong. Corey, you're an advocate for liberalizing copyright mm -hmm. laws. Does the protection of intellectual property really work in protecting creativity? Well, I think that historically copyright, uh, even though it never said so, only really applied to people who are in the entertainment industry. If you say, oh, well, here's a rule that applies if you're making or handling copies in an era where every copy implies a factory to make it, you know, a record factory, a film pr factory, a, a printing press, then really what you're saying is these are rules that the entertainment industry needs to follow. And those rules can be good or bad. I think you just heard Jonathan explain uh, an instance in which the copyright rules are stacked Against, uh, against smaller players and in favor of larger industrial players, and we can say that those are bad rules or good rules, but the thing is that we never ask those rules to apply to the wider public. Now, everything we do on the internet involves making a copy. There is only one way that a computer can man manipulate data, and that's by copying it. Your computer doesn't read a file, it copies the file from one place to another. And so by saying, oh, well, we have this rule that applies when you're handling a copy, and everything on the internet involves handling copies, therefore we'll apply the rule there. We're saying that really everybody who uses the internet needs to follow this very abstruse and difficult entertainment regulation. Um, and it, it, it's very hard to imagine how that's going to work. How would you make a rule that it's on the one hand nuanced enough that Universal Studios can invoke it when they license Harry Potter from Warner and build the Universal Studios theme park, and on the other hand, simple enough that a 12-year-old in her basement in New Jersey can make a Harry Potter fan site and get it right. If it's simple enough for her, it won't be useful for them. And if it's useful for them, it's going to make a criminal out of her when she does things that, before the internet, would have been considered normal and just part of culture. So maybe we need rules for people who aren't in the industry, but I think the idea that we should have a single set of rules that governs industry and culture is like saying we should have finance rules and they should cover you when you loan a friend $5 for lunch. Well, Chris, at our hangar, you have a follow-up. Well, sure. I mean, uh, I guess it depends on how you want to portray the issue in general. I mean, um, I, I, the way I come at the copyright issue is to recognize that, you know, we can have these very kind of airy and fantastical conversations about creativity, but we ought to understand while we're having those conversations that there are real people who, uh, you know, invested in making... Uh, when, you know, be it a book or an album or whatever it may be, there are real people behind that work, and uh, they deserve some basic level of uh, respect. I think from consumers and from, you know, the government. And uh, you know, if we if we care about the internet and we want it to be creating new opportunities, which I assume everybody in this discussion would like to see, um, I don't see the uh, the logic in taking something away from creators or telling them that you know, we shouldn't take their rights, their rights seriously. So, you know, again, now we're stepping into a much more broad discussion, but um, what I see is the real problem right now is that we have entities like the Pirate Bay out there um, who are basically black market distributors. And, um, you know, I'd like to see, I'd like to see more done uh, in, in regards to those people who are actually taking in money off of uh, the labor of artists who are essentially ripping them off. Um, but, you know, there needs to be a more balanced discussion in general on this issue. And I think I agree with Corey very strongly, in fact, um, that the public's rights need to be acknowledged in regards to uh, copyright terms. And, you know, I'm advocating for a 50 year term. And um, I think enforcement and reform needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah, what about that? What about shortening the terms before something well, is Well, shortening the, shortening the terms would be great. I don't think we could get it any shorter than life in 50 because that's the Berne Convention and it's woven into so many international laws. But I don't think that my approach is very airy-fairy. I'm a working artist. I've published 15, 16 books in the last 10 years. I, I think that qualifies me to talk about the livelihoods of at least one artist, which is me. And uh, what I've seen, for example, on the Pirate Bay is them supporting thousands and thousands of independent artists. Um, and moreover, that every effort that I've seen to stop the Pirate Bay, like, for example, in the United Kingdom where I live, we have a national firewall where we're uh, surveilling all internet traffic in order to stop Pirate Bay traffic, which has been totally ineffective at stopping the Pirate Bay and simultaneously put the whole country under warrantless uh, uh, net-wide surveillance. 
I don't think I think that that's a place where the cure is much worse than the, than the disease. Or look sure. at the the Pirate Bay raid in Sweden, where you had an illegal raid that shut down 200 other websites that was ordered by the U.S. Trade Representative and a member of Parliament and invoked without a warrant. I mean, surely you know uh, whatever else we care about as artists, censorship and surveillance should not be in our toolkit for improving our livelihoods. Sure, but I think he makes a good point. If an artist wants to release the material for free, there are plenty of ways for them to do that. If you mm -hmm. choose to give your books away for free, you choose to do that. Mm -hmm. But an artist shouldn't have their work taken from them and distributed. If that's not their choice, it's still their property. Well, it's, I don't think it's anyone's property. Your I intellectual think. property is not your property? Intellectual property is not property. Intellectual property is a are metaphor. No, they're absolutely not my property. They're your property if you buy them. But they're your Which books. is the whole point of this DRM business, right? If you buy a device that's your property mm -hmm. and you're reading my book, why should I be able to trump your physical property rights in that device by being able to enforce policy against it when it actually belongs to you? So are you going to mind if I metaphor? set up a stand outside your book talk tonight and sell your books? And sure, but on? not because it's my property. My daughter is not my property, and there's a bunch of things you could do to her that would upset me. Why is the only thing that we value property? Because it's I have a, an it's, interest it's in your, it. It's, cre it's your creation. Look, it's, you know it's, what? They it's no different than somebody that builds a jet engine or, or creates a new Well, if that's vehicle, the case, then you I mean, only get paid for it once, right? right? If I make a jet engine and you buy it for me, I never get paid again. You have a copyright on it, though. Somebody oh, well, so it's it. not like a jet engine. It's like a book. It's its own no, thing. No, that's what I'm saying. Right, if so it's, it's nothing like a jet engine. It's exactly like a book. And in fact, you're giving copies of your book away. People can well, download yeah. them for free online. Well, it's, it's interesting that you brought up DRM again, because we have a tweet from Kevin who says, let's not forget that publishers are using DRM to manipulate sales and to keep digital books out of the hands of library users. And at least I think this segues really nicely into a discussion about Aaron Schwartz, who, of course, you knew very well. Corey. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron was actually killed in January this year. For those who don't know, he killed himself. Um, after he was charged federally with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of computer fraud, of violating rather the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for systematically downloading academic uh, journal articles. Corey, you knew him. He was the founder of Demand Progress, which launched the campaign against internet censorship bills like SOPA. Uh, you know, what's, what's your take on what happened to Aaron? Well, so I think Aaron cared not one whit about the freedom of information. Uh, I think Aaron cared a lot about the freedom of people. And I think that if you look at the, the places where Aaron put his sights on, like, for example, liberating the American uh, jurisprudence, so the laws of America, which could cost thousands of dollars to research because it, th they were behind a federal paywall instead of out in the public where they should be. Um, uh, you, you see that what he's with the thread that joins them all up, the thread that joins up uh, uh, liberating science that the public has already paid for, but which is locked up in journals and which describes the information that you need to be, by definition, well informed, right? You need to know what scientists have discovered to be well informed, not least every couple of years when someone asks you for a vote based on their theory of how the world works. It'd be nice to know if it conforms to the available evidence, especially when you've already paid to have that evidence gathered. And I think people are freer when they know these things. People are freer when they have access to the law. People are freer when they have access to, uh, to scientific information. And people are certainly more free when uh, their devices aren't uh, locked down in some way that's illegal for them to find out about. Well, Dan, in our Hangout, I know you want to get in on this conversation. Go ahead. Well, I would only point to the difference in uh, public money versus private money in this situation. And in both the hacks, the first one that the FBI started tracking Mr. Schwartz was a PACER system, which is public information funded by taxpayers. And in the second case, uh, a good majority of the articles he was downloading were actually funded by public money. So it's a real question about property rights when you're talking about publicly funded property or intellectual property. Right, so what happens, Corey, to the people uh, that don't have maybe the backing uh, that, that Aaron had? Um, you know, friends like Laurie Lessig, who mm -hmm. was on the show not too long ago, friends well, like I you. I think we know what happens because 97% of the people who receive a federal indictment in this country plead guilty. So either we have the greatest prosecutors in the history of the world who only get it wrong 3% of the time, or the threat of long sentences in an inhumane prison system that's so overcrowded the Supreme Court is ordering California to release prisoners who haven't served their sentences because whatever they've done, it doesn't warrant the human rights abuses that are rampant in our own prison system. Uh, they use this coercion to force people to plead guilty to crimes that they believe they're not guilty of or things that they don't believe are crimes. I mean, what happened to Aaron is just part of a larger pattern of incarceration. And the congressional testimony this week on Aaron's arrest and his subsequent prosecution, the prosecutor suggested that the reason that they continued Aaron's prosecution after the full details of what had happened came to light is they felt that they would be embarrassed 
if it turned out that they'd arrested someone Corey, who they didn't send to jail. Corey, got to pause you there because the television portion of the program is over. We'll pick up where we're leaving off right now. It's streamed at aljazeera.com. So head that way and we'll see you in 10 seconds. Welcome back to the online post show. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Corey Doctoro, finish your thought. So if the, if the fact is that we have a system that is stacked against individuals where federal prosecutors, once they set your sights on you, you go to jail regardless of your guilt or the justness of the law that you've been, that you've been indicted under, there's only one way we can, we can fix it, and that's by organizing. And there's only one tool we have these days to organize, and that's the Internet. When I was an activist in the 1980s, 98% of my job was stuffing envelopes and writing addresses on them, and 2% was figuring out what to put in the envelopes. And we get the envelopes for free now. And so keeping the Internet free and open, making it so that, for example, you can't just say, oh, that infringes copyright, take it down, without any proof, uh, um, making it so that that's not woven into the legal fabric of the Internet, uh, is really important because we've seen that in politics, copyright uh, uh, notices are a common way of silencing political opposition, bogus copyright notices for which there are no appreciable penalties. So you mentioned activism and online organization. How do you organize a cause online without using surveillance-friendly technology? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, Facebook has, is, is kind of the, the paradox of the activist, right? Because there yeah. they all are, but right. there they all aren't. But here's a great example of a tool that we used in the SOPA fight that made a huge difference that Aaron actually helped build along with the Fight for the Future people, which was a tool that you could put up on your website. Now, SOPA had a provision that said if you have a website, you have to police everything everyone posts to it for right. copyright infringement, which is kind of impossible because you'd have to make sure they didn't link to websites where anyone infringed copyright. So if someone linked to Tumblr, you'd have to see everything on Tumblr and make sure it didn't infringe copyright and there are things you will never unsee no matter how hard you try if you see everything on Tumblr. So you could put a little widget into your website that when people came it would say, hey, I see you. Um, you like my website. I'm going to have to shut it down if this dumb law passes. What's your zip code? And you enter your zip code and it says, oh, well, here's your congressman. Here's your senator. Here's how they stand on it. Here's a button you can click to phone them up. And we put 8 million phone calls through to Congress that way and retain no data. Right? So there's a very privacy-friendly way of reaching 8 million Congress, uh, of, of having 8 million constituents reach their congressmen and But you know there's so many people sitting out there that they, they know how to use their computer well enough to get on, do what they mm. need to do, and that's it. And they wonder everything, every time something pops up, am I being tracked? Is mm -hmm. this being stored? How uh -huh. do you know? Well, you don't. But say we were talking about waterborne parasites instead, and you said, well, how do I know about all the microscopic things that might be in my tap water that could be killing me at this moment? I don't have a microscope. I'm not a microbiologist. The thing is, we don't put microbiologists in jail or threaten them if they discover bad things in the water supply. But we do threaten researchers who discover bad things going on on the internet. We allow kind of uh, toxic dumping into the internet of bad privacy, anti-privacy technology. In Canada, where I'm from, they've proposed a, a spyware or a, an anti-spam law, and the entertainment industry has said, "Yeah, you can have an anti-spam law, but we want an exception that lets us secretly plant spyware that surveils and deletes files on people's computers, malicious software that goes straight into their computers if we think that it helps us defend copyrights." Right, so um, we would never say to an industry, well, your profit maximiza maximization strategy means that you can sometimes put intestinal parasites into the water. Well, actually, we sometimes do it to big ag, but that's the problem, right, isn't it? That we, we live in a system where profits trump public health, and, and the way that we organize to, to fix that is by using networked tools. Well, this tweet from Mikey kind of sums up what people are saying. The crux of the discussion is if people want privacy, piracy or free information. But there's a video comment here, Corey, uh, from a member of our community asking a question. Have a listen. Hi, my name is Dan Masolia, and I'm a student studying internet law at IIT Chicago Kent 
in Chicago, United States. My question is that if companies and governments are unwilling to protect data privacy, what can a user do to protect it on his or her own? Thank you. So what can we do? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of things that you can do for your own hygiene, the equivalent of getting your own water filter at home, right? You can, you can use a free and open operating system, not because you're going to look at all the source code in it and make sure that there's no bad stuff lurking in it, but at least the free and open stuff, no one gets into trouble if they out it for doing something bad. So the bad stuff tends to get discovered and fixed really quickly. So I use a flavor of Linux called Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which you can install on any Mac or PC, and which works brilliantly. I've been using it for years, and I haven't missed... Uh, the commercial operating systems one little bit. Um, you can use good encryption. Uh, you can encrypt your hard drive. You can use proxies like the, the Pirate Bay actually operates one of the best proxies out there, uh, iPredator, which is $5 a month and gives you an enormous amount of, of privacy when you're using the internet. And you can use ad blockers. All of those contribute. But ultimately, we don't solve this individually. We solve this collectively. So technology can make us better or worse. What, what path do you think we're on right now? Well, I think you have to be an optimist and a pessimist. I'm a pessimist because I think if we do nothing, it will get very bad indeed. I mean, when you look at the extent to which spyware can can compromise people, you know, there were seven rent-to-own companies and a, and a, a, a laptop security software who entered into a settlement with the FTC last September because the laptop security software let them turn on the cameras and the microphones and the laptop over the internet, read the keystrokes and the hard drive and the screen. And they stipulated in their settlement with the FTC that they had been secretly video recording their customers having sex, secretly video recording their children in the nude, miking their conversations, grabbing their passwords, their confidential medical, financial, and legal records and conversations, as well as plundering their hard drives just for the fun of it. And the FTC, they said, well, you can't do this anymore unless you put it in the terms and conditions. Right? That was their answer. Unless you if put you, it in the If you put it in the fine in the print, giant. somewhere in that long document mm -hmm. that says, you know, by being dumb enough to use this service, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother in the mouth and wear your underwear and make long distance calls <laughs> and eat all the food in your fridge. Um, you're, you're okay with it. So it could get bad, right? If that's, mm -hmm. the, if that's the, the way, if that's the gravitas which with, we, with which we regulate the nervous system of the 21st century, like it was nothing more than the second coming of video on demand or a new kind of telephone or the world's most perfect pornography distribution system, then that's what we'll get. But I'm an optimist because I believe that if we do something about it, we can make it better, right? If you look at the SOPA fight, when I was in DC a week before the SOPA fight, everyone I knew on the Hill, all my, all my Hill rat insider friends, they said, go home, forget about it. They've counted the votes. The industry's pushing for this, have so much money invested in these congressmen that they'll never defy them. They've counted up the signatures. You're going to lose. Figure out what to do about a world where SOPA is the law. Don't try and fight SOPA. And instead of taking that advice, internet activists who are outside the Beltway organized in ways that the world had never seen and just kicked the crap out of it. Right? Uh, by the end of it, the co-sponsors of that bill were rushing to beat each other to the microphone to issue statements opposing the bill that they were co-sponsors on. You got 20 seconds left to wrap this up. Um, I guess I should say I have a new book out, and it's called Homeland. <laughs> and you're doing a book talk tonight in D.C. for anyone who is in D.C. at Busboys and Poets at 6.30, right? Thank you very much. Corey, yeah. Dr. O, thank you for being on our show. Thanks to everyone in our Google Hangout. Before we part entirely, Malika has a few other stories we're following. Instagram users will now have a new location to add to their geotagged photos of cats, food, and trees. North Korea is freeing up access to mobile internet, but there's a catch. The Next Web reports that only foreigners and visitors will have access to the expanded service. Journalist Jean Lee may have been the first to Instagram from within North Korea. She captured signs welcoming nuclear test scientists to Pyongyang. Her Instagram feed contains more pictures of the city. Our next lead comes from Pakistan, where a rare countrywide power outage left residents in the dark for two hours. Netizens got the hashtag blackout trending during the outage. On Twitter, several shared pictures of their surroundings, while others put a humorous spin on the matter, posting pictures like these. Authorities attributed the blackout to a plant malfunction. Well, after electricity returned to Pakistan, Faiza summed up the blackout with this tweet. Proud of Pakistan, a nation that handles blackout type situations in a positive, humorous way. Everyone remembers how New York handled it. Lastly, the internet is still all abuzz following Hollywood's biggest night, but the Oscar win for one of Sunday's films may not have been possible if not for an iPhone. 
The film Searching for Sugar Man tells the story of an American musician who becomes wildly popular in South Africa, but the filmmakers ran out of money before the movie was complete. The director turned to a vintage camera iPhone app to shoot the remaining scenes, and he was rewarded. The film won the best documentary feature. Now these are just a few of the stories we're following, so let us know which ones have caught your eye using the hashtag AJStream. Lisa? All right, on Tuesday, one year after the controversial killing of Trayvon Martin, is distrust in the police drawing a rift between the American public and those who protect them? Send us your thoughts and your questions on that, and until then, we'll see you online.